Avalon, a very warm welcome to another edition of Talking Germany, the show where we do just that. And my guest today is a man who's viewed by many here in Germany as the outstanding theatre director of his generation. And here he is, Thomas Ostermeyer. Hello. Thomas, thank you very, very much for joining us here today thank on you. Talking Germany. Now, Thomas Ostermeyer wants the enfant terrible of German theatre, is these days an artistic director of one of Berlin's most stately and bourgeois establishments, the excellent Schaubühne Theatre. Along the way in his colourful career, he's also picked up a prestigious Golden Lion at the Venice Biennale for his life's work, no less, and that at an age where he probably hasn't even had a midlife crisis. So I'm sure it'll be Definitely fascinating. <laughs> we'll talk about that in just a second. I'm sure it will be fascinating to hear what the sometimes controversial Mr. Ostermeyer has to say about the following topics. State-sponsored culture. Germany puts up more than 9 billion euros a year to subsidize the arts. It's a massive sum and we ask, is it money well spent? Battered and bruised, it took a long time for Germany to actually ban the corporal punishment of children. Our studio guest is among the many victims of a once widespread practice. And digital decentralization, it might be internet subcultures, the Arab Spring, or Germany's pirate party. It's a whole new way of interacting, so how's it impacting on theater? Thomas Ostermeyer, uh, thank you very, very much for joining us today. You, uh, you interrupted me there as I, when I said you're not old enough to have ever had a getting midlife there, crisis. You're I getting there. Say, have you had one yet, there. a midlife crisis? Well, uh, there are <laughs> symptoms of it, yes. <laughs> OK, we're not going to go there, yeah? Um, <laughs> lots of productions, lots of controversies, lots of success in your career. I would like, when I go home today, to be able to phone my mum and tell her what a typical Thomas Ostermeyer production is like. What's the, what's the trademark of your theatre? I try to be, uh, you will be surprised now, uh, I try to be very honest with the writer and with the text. So I'm really trying to get to the core the heart of the play. Authenticity. Yeah, in a way, if uh. you want so, because this is ex ex pretty extraordinary for a German director. So uh -huh. I would I would consider myself being a very conservative director. Mm -hmm. But I think when you really get to the core of a play, especially Shakespeare plays, but also any other writer, it is pretty dark and pretty desperate and cruel and bloody as it is true for most of the Shakespeare uh, pieces he wrote. So um, that's maybe why people still consider me being provocative, enfant terrible mm. and uh, everything you're, you're saying. But it is, it is because I'm trying to be honest with the play. OK, you're sitting here and you're smiling and you're looking warm and you're sounding like a nice, ordinary guy. And this is the, I mean... I uh, am. <laughs> <laughs> this remind, I, I found a quote of yours, yeah, where you said that the, the kind of plays that you like to go mm. and see mm. are plays, and I thought, oh, God, this is going to be an interesting show. They're plays that speak of the humiliation of being born. Yeah, that was in, <gasps> <laughs> that was in an interview with The Guardian, yeah, uh -huh. I, I, I said this. Yeah, well, this is a, a thought of existentialism where you say, uh, okay, uh, now that I'm born, what am, am I going to do with it? But it is pretty humiliating because you're not asked <laughs> to be born. And uh, nobody tells you when you are, or you, you pretty soon find out that you're going to die. And this is also pretty humiliating. So mm. every now and then you tell yourself, maybe it's better not to be born so that you're not going to die. So <laughs> things, uh, things of that, yeah, it's, it's, it's true. I'm laughing some existentialist laughter here. Yeah, yeah. It is, mm. because uh, this is uh, the, the, the basic humiliation is mm. that it's not going on forever. So what, why? being here. I read, I read a fasc fascinating quote the other day, life is desperately short and life is desperately long. And I thought it was True. very good. Yeah, very True. good, eh? yeah. True. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, first impressions there from the uh, existential Thomas Ostermeyer. Uh, here are some more impressions of what you might call blood and mud theatre. Thomas Ostermeyer and his golden director's chair. The artistic director of Berlin's prestigious Schaubühne Theater is just in his early 40s, but he's already picked up a golden lion for a lifetime achievement at the Venice Biennale. Ostermeyer is an international theater star. 
His productions are export hits worldwide, like his Hamlet in Athens. Ostermeyer staged the Shakespeare tragedy as a mud fight. Hamlet is a modern figure floundering in a web of intrigue, idealism, and insanity. I'm trying not to lose my head. <laughs> Hamlet was the product of a collaboration with the Athens Festival. It's just one of the pieces the Schaubühne has brought to cities like Sydney, Jerusalem, and New York. Towards the end of the 1990s, Ostermeyer made his name at the now defunct Baraka Theater in Berlin. It was an experimental stage for a young generation of boundary pushers. In 2000, he and three others took over the artistic direction of the Schaubühne. Ostermeyer was 31 at the time and started out by shocking conservative audiences with crude social realism. He produced new plays with a young cast run as a collective based on principles of co-determination and equal pay. Actor Lars Eidinger is one of the Schaubühne's best-known faces. After 13 years of working together, they have the happy father-son relationship that Ostermeyer himself never had. You don't remember? There was a bit of confusion, so I came on stage and told you what you were supposed to do, and you went, yeah, but Papa... Oh! <laughs> Ostermeyer now directs classics like A Doll's House by Henrik Ibsen or Shakespeare's Measure for Measure, shown here at the Salzburg Festival last year. Eidinger plays the straight-laced Angelo, deputy to the Duke of Vienna. Angelo enacts a law that makes sex outside marriage illegal, but he turns out to be a hypocrite. <laughs> Drastic scenes with existential questions. What will end up being sacrificed? Principles or passions? Meine Position im Staat werden so viel schwerer werden, dass du an deinem eigenen Gerücht ersticken, nach übler Nachrede ersticken wirst. Angelo abuses his power in ways that strike a chord with modern audiences. Power and sex, power and money. Ostermeyer provocatively hits a nerve here with Ibsen's Jon Gabriel Borgmann. Ich war an der Macht. In mir war unbeirrbar, das Bewusstsein berufen zu sein. Überall im Land lagen gefesselte Millionen und haben gerufen. Ostermeyer's Schaubühne is about continuity alongside experimentation. He believes in ensemble acting with the same actors in different roles. Last year, Ostermeyer extended his contract with the theater. He may have become less anarchic, but he hasn't lost his desire to break with convention. And today, he's our guest on Talking Germany, Thomas Ostermeyer. Um, there's lots about your theater there, Thomas. Let's just talk about you and your early days a little bit. You didn't exactly grow up in a theater family, did you? No, not at all. Mm -hmm. But my uh, parents, they, they liked theater, but they were very petit bourgeois, uh, um, normal, even proletarian uh, background. My, my mother was a shop seller, my father was a soldier, but uh, they were making music. It was a, a family with, with a lot of music and with a Bavarian culture, so to say which means also a lot of amateur theater at home, not, uh, not so much, but in school and in, in, in church, um, but not an intellectual, intellectual or academic background. Okay, and then you, you uh, eventually came to Berlin to train uh, as an actor, I believe. True. Originally, yeah? Yes. Were, I you, want... were you a good actor? I can't really say. I, the only thing I can say is that I didn't feel at ease on stage uh -huh. because I was too tall and I was always wondering how I can play any romantic love scene with an actress. <laughs> <laughs> 
two heads uh, smaller than me and so I, I really was a bit uh, clumsy okay. and so I decided not to, even so I had a, a time at the Berliner Ensemble when uh, Heiner Müller was still exactly. director, yeah. I, I, I worked there as, uh, as an actor and it, it, it was okay, it was nice but uh, I was always more interested in sitting in the audience with the director, watching the other actors, talking of the lightning, of mm -hmm. the sound and so on and so on. So it felt pretty um, normal. Okay, and then the next step was that you came, you went to the Ernst Busch School of Performing True. Arts. Yeah, True. this is a legendary school, and this is—you've said somewhere that you you grew up in a sort of an East German tradition of theatre in a way. Yeah, because I did, I started uh, acting at the um, UDK with a very famous, important German director called Einar Schleif, mm -hmm. and he was from East uh, Germany. So I, I, my first steps was where with him. And then the second step was Ernst Busch uh, School in 92. So two years after the war came down and the re reunification was done and still all the, uh, the, the professors, all, all the teachers there were teachers from East Germany and the whole spirit was, was very uh, DDR uh, East spirit, German. East yeah. German spirit. What does that mean exactly? Well, uh, a very um, high estimation of craft, uh -huh. of That's skills, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, not so much psychological kind of look at yourself, where are you from, look for your own wounds inside yourself, but more of look outside, look around you, look in which kind of society you live and that the human being is a result of the surroundings he's living in and not so much out of his individual character. Yeah, it's more, a more sociological kind of approach to theatre. Okay, okay, but you took that sociological approach to theatre and then you went off and you became the bad boy of German theatre with this in-your-face theatre that was all about sex and drugs and criminality and power and what all these kind of sort of corrupting and difficult moments in human existence. What was all that about? As, what, what were you as, trying to achieve? As theatre was from its beginning, mm. always. I mean, look at uh, Oedipus, King Oedipus. It's about a guy who finds out that he has sex with his mother and killed his father. Indeed. <laughs> Point taken. Yeah, for, for <laughs> one of the first plays of, of human mankind. Yeah, so yeah. I think theatre is always about this, what you mentioned. And these uh, British uh, playwrights, they just did uh, what they had to do and talked about what they had to talk about. You're talking about Sarah Kane here, Sarah Mark Kane, Ravenhill, Mark Ravenhill, these young Hill, British Martin playwrights Krim. who influenced you a lot. You, you put the, their stuff out. I mean, the, the, like Sarah Kane, there was more of her work being performed in Germany by you in true. particular yeah, we than had, in the UK. We yeah. had all of her plays at a certain uh, period of the Schaubern and we had all of her plays and repertoire. I was a bit, big admirer of her work and we had uh, f a little time of, of contact and mm. uh, she was a very nice uh, person and very influential for my work because I found out that uh, with the tenderness and the fragility she was approaching uh, her issues, you can uh, talk about the most horrifying things which you have to face as a human being and mm -hmm. that was... That she was a, a very important influence, not only because of her plays, but also for me, approaching classical drama, approaching Shakespeare, approaching Ibsen, in the spirit of her writing. OK, we'll talk about that very, very shortly. Now, uh, I know in one interview that I read with Thomas, he said he was asked, what makes German theatre different from theatre elsewhere? And he said, we've got lots of money. And it's certainly the case that here in Germany, the arts are heavily subsidised. However, now a group of four academics and cultural managers have got together to write a book that's caused a little bit of a stir by uh, calling for Germany's arts funding to be slashed, and not just to be slashed, to be slashed by half. The provocative book asks, is Germany's cultural sector seriously ill? The four authors' answer is yes. They're calling for cultural subsidies to be cut in half. The radical overhaul would slash the number of museums in the country from 6,300 to 3,200, reduce 140 state theaters to 70, and half the number of libraries to 4,000. 
The authors believe Germany's cultural policy is in paralysis. They argue that the 1970s ideal of culture for all has failed. And they say that the private sector should step in with financing. A horror scenario for many culture makers. The private culture economy is purely profit-oriented. That means what's most marketable is what gets produced. Like the magic flute for a crowd of 10,000. But everything on the fringe, composers ostracized in the Third Reich, contemporary music or new operas, wouldn't happen. For the authors, culture for all was really always just culture for a few. They say most of the art supported by the state is produced for a small minority of people interested in high culture. And it's all too much of the same thing. Every year, Germany invests 9.6 billion euros in culture, 1.6% of the budget. But some say that's a good thing. It's not an unnecessary luxury. It's an expression of humanity. It expresses the basic values of a society. The need is widespread. Despite public protests over culture spending cuts, the authors of the contentious book say Germany is still a paradise for the arts. Well, Thomas and I were just talking about how people from the UK, when they come to Germany and see the amount of spending here, how very, I suppose you could say, jealous they get, yeah? We must justify it, however, or you must. 140 theatres. Well, How? Uh, Why? Uh, let's, let's put it that way. Um, first of all, when you, you can mention these numbers, but you also can mention other numbers. If you talk about the cultural budget of the city of Berlin, of, of the whole budget the city of Berlin is spending out of its tax money, 1.9% are for the arts and culture. 1.2 for operas and theatres out of these 1.9 and only 0.7% are for theatres. So if you think of uh, um, having any more money or, or helping the, 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 the budget, the financial budget of the mm -hmm. city, it won't help anything. And there are other cities like Leipzig, they spend 9% of the household on culture, on arts and culture. So it is, it sounds a lot of money if you talk of nine millions, but it is actually talking of the budget, a very small percentage of the city's money. But you know what people say. I mean, the school that my children go to mm. is viewed as one of the better public schools, mm. state se sector mm. schools here mm. in Berlin, mm. yeah? They don't have toilet paper. Mm. Mm. Yeah, but we, we don't have their toilet paper in our theatre. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> no, I mean, uh, I think this, what we have um, in, in, in Germany is, is due to the fact that at, at the moment uh, in history, the, the, the new bourgeois society decided to gather the tax and then to spend it on the things they really think that are important, which is public schools, for example, kindergarten, roads, but also political institutions like parliaments and so on, which nobody would ever put into question. And I think part of this dem democratic culture is an institution like theatre where the, the community mm -hmm. of the society spend money in order to have a kind of a mirror reflecting problems of the society they live in. And this is not only luxury, yeah. but it's also something to make this society survive because mm -hmm. they are facing their own contradictions. Okay, okay. Uh, but one of the points that is made that if there is so much money spent on state subsidized mm -hmm. theatre mm -hmm. in this case, mm -hmm. that it can become bloated, it can become a little bit sort of, you know, heavy and, and set in its ways. And I know, for example, I was reading somewhere that you at the Schaubühne, you have, I don't know how many, you tell me the exact figure, how many people you have? 220 uh, permanent okay. employees. And how many of those are actually like set builders, for example? Um, in the workshops, I would say around 30. Yeah, and this is interesting. You've got 30 people just building yeah. sets. Yes. And, you know, when I go to your theater, Slightly less so now than it used to be the case, but I'm sitting there at the beginning, waiting for the curtain to come mm, up, mm. and everybody's sitting there, se there saying, I'm really looking forward to seeing mm. what the stage setting's going to be like, because mm. they're going to spend lots and lots and lots mm. of money on mm. it, and mm. it'll be incredibly spectacular. Mm. And mm. then it happens, and everybody goes, whoa, mm. and then there's a little bit of theatre after mm. that. Mm. Aha, so you're talking about the fact that the set is more important than the acting? 
Well, that's what you just said. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wouldn't say. I wouldn't say this is true for my way of making theatre. Okay. I, I think uh, set design is, as you say it, uh, as you mention it, much more important in Germany than in France or in Great Britain. Mm, this is due to the fact that we have the money. So because of the decades behind us, we developed this skill uh, very much. But also because we, we can afford it. Okay. And, and this kind of, of set or aesthetics, as I would call it, is part of the success story of German theatre because it is a success story. We are touring last, uh, last uh, season, we toured in 30 cities around the world, mm -hmm. giving 90 performances all, ar all around the world. So why, why is that? And I think it is because of our acting, which is developed out of the ensemble yeah. structure, and of our aesthetics, which is not one-to-one -one naturalism. Okay, I don't want to break you off, but let's talk, while we're talking about the aesthetics, we're going to look at uh, what, what your production mm. uh, that's been very successful, 300 performances and more around the world, as Thomas B has been saying, of uh, a doll's house, uh, Ibsen's uh, doll's house. It's got all of those aesthetics and everything that he's been talking about. Let's have a look now for a minute or so at that production. Nein, 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 heute will ich nicht egoistisch sein, heute will ich nur an dich denken. Aber eins muss ich dir doch noch erzählen. Hast du gehört, was uns Wunderbares passiert ist? Nein, was denn? Mein Mann ist Direktor der Aktienbank geworden. Wo bleibt denn meine kleine Schnecke? Hm? Hier kommt sie, deine Schnecke. Der neunte Schuss ging sauber durch die Stirn. Antisma, fantastic performance as Nora, the central character in a doll's house by Henrik Ibsen. Now, I love her. You love her. <laughs> 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 Enough said. Perhaps it would. Um, the central character, Nora. What's the fascination for you with her? What's the fascination with Ibsen? It's all got to do with something with, called the bourgeoisie, which is what you, a word you've used a lot today. Y yeah, well, I mean, we are living in a bourgeois society and uh, Ibsen was uh, writing in a time where bourgeois society kind of was invented for Norway, uh, for Scandinavia, and with all the contradictions of a bourgeois society, which means am I climbing up the social ladder or not? How do I deal with the fears I have to, to drop down the social ladder again? Um, and this is what he is working on. So it's a society which has described how capitalism influences uh, the, the souls of human beings. And this is something which we are still facing, maybe even worse than at that time. And uh, what is for me the, the, the big scandal is that we are so close to 19th hundred century values in these plays of Ibsen nowadays, getting back there. Yeah, we've gone forward and we're going back again. We, are, we, we <laughs> gone like forward and history. in this reactionary times we are going yeah. backward and yeah. approaching our society again to 19th hundred century bourgeois society of Ibsen. That's why it is for me so interesting to do these plays. And is it perhaps so very interesting for you as well, because you too are a bourgeois who didn't come from a bourgeois background, that you found yourself suddenly in this bourgeois milieu, as people it, like to say, it and maybe is, all those contradictions yes, true, are incorporated true. in your person. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. It is... No, no, but you're right. <laughs> it is... Uh, I'm just looking for the English word in, 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 in French and Italian would be arrivisti. I don't uh, know if it's the same in English. Uh, somebody, so, who, somebody who is... Uh, what, God, what, what, what would you say? Somebody who has made it in society. But yeah, right. Word, yeah. So I'm, I'm, like, I myself have this... Uh, a uh, nouveau riche is the word that is used in English, yeah, interestingly. You see. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is that what you are? You're not well, in a way, I'm no, not nouveau no, no. riche, but I, I kind of came from another social background yeah. and, and arrived in, 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 well, in the middle of the bourgeois mm -hmm. class. Mm -hmm. And that's why 
probably I'm so much fascinated of these plays because they are dealing also with this, okay, when you know how it is to be poor and not to have uh, money and not to have all this, um, all this academic or intellectual background, mm -hmm. which you need to survive that, that might even install a certain fear inside yourself mm. that you that you feel a bit minor to the others yeah. and this is a very dramatic uh, uh, inner conflict which in my point of view is drives the characters of Ibsen I can imagine it did. I suppose there's a happy ending to the story because finally in the year 2000, Germany banned corporal punishment against children. There was a new law mm. which actually said all children have a right to an upbringing free of violence. Mm. Yeah? You were beaten by your father. Mm. What can you tell us? <laughs> Nothing more than that. Um, I, I, I could say that um, what, it, what was even worse was a psychological way of putting pressure and uh, he, he decided to have um, times p sequences of weeks where he's not uh, where he was not talking uh, to his sons and that, that was even more painful than the moment of yeah. of, 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 of being beaten mm. um, but I mean on the other hand I, I was uh, thinking about it quite often because this kind of upbringing in this very conservative, way and or with, with very strict morals and, and discipline um, always gave me a kind of, I, I wouldn't dare say enemy, but uh, somebody in front who I have to face and get rid of at a, at, at a certain moment. And this created a lot of maybe even uh, creative uh, power for, for, for my work because I knew what I didn't want and I knew wh where against what I was, I was fighting with, with my work. It's very interesting that you say that because I know that when you talk about what you expect from your actors, you're looking for exactly that kind of antagonistic interaction between yeah i'm looking for an antagonistic interaction but I'm, I'm 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 more and more or the last years i'm i'm, I'm definitely looking for not a relationship of of pressure or of of brutal discipline because i know when you try to be creative uh, you need to have uh, a feeling of being sheltered a feeling of being in a safe place a, a feeling of trust um of actually like feeling at home, at ease. Mm -hmm. uh, if there's any pressure around, uh, mm -hmm. you, you cannot make uh, an actor work uh, or, or, or be creative or any other artist probably. Nevertheless, you did say something very interesting. You said if you don't have a problem, you shouldn't go on stage. Yeah, sure, but that is more uh, 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 an acting method. I think mm -hmm. um, for me, drama is the art of the conflict. So if you as an actor, but also generally spoken as a theater maker, if there is no problem in the story you want to tell me or in the situation of the character, there's no need to go on stage because why would you listen to somebody uh, uh, who is not trying to solve anything? This makes drama, this makes creates the interest. Um, this, th this is the only reason for me to go on stage. Do you know, um, in, in your business, because you're going to know a lot more people than I do, who you can sort of, you, you've got more to choose from, do you, do you know people who are happy, but are also creative artists? No, I think um, that uh, the feeling of, um, as you were mentioning this, this quote saying, uh, the humiliation being born, the feeling of that there is something uh, wrong, or the Hamlet feeling, the world is out of joint, this is... I think the basis for somebody to become an artist, mm -hmm. because if you don't have any problem with the world, there's no reason to paint a, a, a painting, to, to write a novel or a theater play. 
And you've taken us back to those very big existential questions. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> questions like, can uh, art change lives? Can politics change lives? Uh, can the internet change lives? You bet it can. The question is, I suppose, for the better or for the worse? This is a classified message from Anonymous. They wear the stylized mask depicting the 16th century revolutionary Guy Fawkes. The symbol has been adopted worldwide by thousands of hackers and activists and used as a symbol of popular protest. Twitter and Facebook have been used as tools to overthrow dictators in Tunisia, Egypt and Libya. The global Occupy movement has harnessed the internet to mobilize thousands against social inequality and the power of corporations. And the Pirate Party is shaking up German politics as a new force to be reckoned with. They stand for democracy and transparency in an internet age. It's a turning point in history. Turning points crystallize around an event like the storming of the Bastille. But the French Revolution actually lasted five years. It became apparent in 2011 that the Internet is not just an information platform or a new technology, but the infrastructure for a new level of civilization. Many, especially young people, are weary of conventional politics. Could the Internet provide a chance for better citizen participation? Do we need a digital democracy? Of course. I can't understand why today, with all the technical possibilities that we have, that we still have to put up with corrupt political institutions. The Internet offers a lot of opportunities of involving people more in decision-making processes. If they are made more transparent, it would give those who are interested the opportunity to participate. We have to ask ourselves how we create a situation online where we can condense information and make decisions clear and understandable, so people want to engage with them. The online community believes in swarm intelligence, that large groups of people are better at solving problems than a few, that the collective defines public opinion, not the media. Careful. We're dealing with a powerful Pandora's box. We urgently need a functioning source of control, credible, independent, honest journalists. Large parts of the Internet are already controlled by a few companies. They are the rulers of global codes, battling for dominance in the Internet of the future. Our rights as citizens don't necessarily count, just the terms and conditions of a big company based in the US. We don't even know what data they store on us or what they do with that data. We've lost control of that. Citizens in Russia are taking to the streets to call for freedom and democracy, arranging their gatherings in advance online. So what's next for the brave new networked world? The wheel of history is in motion. There will be anything but standstill, anything but things staying the same. On the contrary, we're at the end of an era. OK, I'm going to ask you the big question. Is the Internet changing the world for the better or the worse? Oh, I, can, uh, I cannot answer that. Uh, is, is, uh, you know, I think uh, it's always di dialectic. There's always a good and a, and a bad side. I mean, in any uh, progress uh, human mankind uh, took, there is um, a dark side to it. I mean, Indeed. we have uh, public uh, or all the transportation, cars, and all that. Of course, we are we are more flexible, we are more mobile. But it's on the same. On the other hand, we destroy our uh, our uh, umwelt, our, our world around. Mm -hmm. So I I I, I cannot say. I probably uh, the positive sides are, are more. Mm -hmm. uh, I did promise the viewers that we might just touch on the impact that the internet is possibly having on the theatre. Yeah, I, I would. I, I don't see any uh, impact, any any uh, impact which is concrete coming from the internet. I only see that 
um, this internet, this digitalized generation, uh, the younger people are having a tendency to come back to theater, at least to our theater, to the uh -huh. Schaubühne. How do you know that? Well, we, we make polls. Yeah. We, I'm, I'm um, quite often in the foyer. I'm, yeah. I'm watching my You're audience. You're hanging out. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm seeing the people watching our shows. Yeah. So I'm trying to make myself an, an image of, of them. Mm -hmm. And I have the feeling that they kind of are fed up a little bit of only television uh, or computers entertainment because um, theatre provides them with a three-dimensional view on problems and three-dimensional means that you can look at a problem from different angles. There's not only one truth um, which is written down and you can read on a screen, but you have to make up your own uh, what the story really is about and what it wants to tell you. Mm -hmm. and, and this kind of freedom in, in interpretation of a story or of a problem, you tend to have more in theatre than in the other arts. And I, I, I do have the feeling that a lot of young people um, do feel a need uh, to have that. And this is a result of uh, our digitalized world. Okay. I've a bit, we, we're running out of time just to wheel a little bit. And I, just, I want to ask you one question before we move on to the traditional quiz at the end of the show. Mm -hmm. uh, it intrigued me an awful lot. You were once asked about your Germanness and you said that there is plenty of Germanness in you, mm. but that you <gasps> flinch mm. when you think of your Germanness. What is it that makes you flinch? I, I think this is part of, uh, of being German, is trying to deny uh, to be German, that you have a, a broken uh, relationship towards your own national, nationality, which is probably part uh, due to, the, to history, but also due to what, uh, yeah, what, what the cliché of a German is, and the cliché of a German I don't uh, feel at ease with this cliché. Okay, okay. I think we'll move on to our traditional quiz, as promised, at the end I of the show. So. Yeah. Quick questions, relatively quick answers, please. Yeah. Uh, Thomas Ostermeyer, are you a traditionalist or a modernizer? I am uh, more a traditionalist. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I'm more a traditionalist. Okie dokie. <laughs> Do you prefer emotion or intellect? Emotion, definitely. Extremism or compromise? Extremism. Is life tragic or comic? Tragic, comic. Is life pain or pleasure? Um, <laughs> painful pleasure. Is all the world a stage, as Shakespeare said, or is all the world a virtual reality? A stage, definitely. My daughter this morning said, a virtual reality, of course. Oh, yeah. wow. <laughs> Very interesting, <laughs> eh? 16 years old, yeah, different generation yeah. altogether. Okay, it's been great talking to you, Thomas, yeah? Thanks for having me. A fantastic guest. That's all we can cram in with him this time round. The challenged and challenging, the thoughtful and existential Thomas Ostermeyer. If you've enjoyed his company as much as I have, then do come back next week. Bye-bye. Cheers. -bye. <laughs>